Good morning. This morning we're going to be reading from Psalm 41. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, When will he die and his name perish? And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words, while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They say, A deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me, but you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Thank you, Cynthia. You know, every summer, and, and, and when I'm in between preaching series, we meditate on the Psalms. We're in between series right now. We're going to open the book of Daniel starting next Sunday. But between Daniel and the Advent series of, of the last month, we're going to look at Psalm 41. That's where we are today. Uh, we meditate on the Psalms often as a church. These are ancient prayers of God's people, the ancient Hebrews sung to God, and especially sung to God no, no, not only in, in thanksgiving and joy, but also in despair and in grief and in suffering and in fear. And uh, that is what Psalm 41 really is, the, the fear and suffering and despair uh, side of things, but not without hope. This is a psalm still full of hope. Uh, you know, Psalm 41 actually closes the very first book of the Psalms. There are five books, 150 Psalms, five edi uh, edited into five books. Psalm 41 closes Psalms book one. And what's interesting is the first book of the Psalms opened up with a blessing. You remember what, how Psalm 1 begins? Really, essentially, blessed is the person who delights in the law of God and meditates on that law. Blessed is the person who delights in the word of God. And now the first book of the psalm, uh, the, the first book of Psalms closes with another blessing. Did you notice that in verse 1 of Psalm 41? Blessed is the one who considers the poor. So book 1 of the Psalms has book ends. The book ends are blessed are those who delight in their maker and in his words. And it closes with, blessed are those who serve their neighbor. Loving God and loving your neighbor really is the essential core teaching of the Bible from beginning to end. Delighting in your maker and serving your neighbor. And in that order, it's real, the order is really important. Delighting in God and serving your neighbor. And I think that's a really good reminder as we begin the year of 2021. I hope you're going to see this from Psalm 41. Biblical faith recognizes the needs of others and our own needs as well. The type of faith that the Bible talks about that belongs to you as a gift of God if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, it recognizes the needs of other people without overlooking and especially being aware of your own needs as well. And the believer in this God of the Bible can serve those who are helpless, knowing all too well your own helplessness. And I want to talk to you about being mindful of the weaknesses of other people around you. In the world, in the nation, in the community, in this room, maybe even in your home. 
or where you work. Being mindful of the weaknesses of others, but also being mindful of your own weakness. That's the second thing. And then finally, being mindful of Christ's weakness. That's what brings all of this together and will give us hope. The weakness of Jesus Christ. It may sound amazing, but God became weak, and we're going to talk about that. So the weakness of others, your own weakness, and Jesus Christ's weakness. Now, the person who thinks biblically, someone who thinks and looks at the world and looks at life and looks at themselves according to the wisdom of the Bible is mindful of the weaknesses of other people. Just begins to naturally, over time, see the needs of other people. The Hebrew word here in verse 1 for the poor, it just it, it meant weak. It meant those who are lowly or those who are thin. Anyone who lacked resources, resources to help themselves, anyone who lacked the physical health to take care of themselves, anyone who lacked in that society the social status to be able to flourish, like everybody wants to flourish in life. That's what it meant holistically to be poor. And examples of such poverty were defined and identified by God in the Old Testament as widows and orphans and refugees, just to name three representative types of poverty. And David tells us that the person is blessed who considers them. The word consider, it meant essentially to take into account to ponder something, to meditate on something, right? Not only meditating on the law of God in Psalm 1, but here in Psalm 41, meditating on the needs of the poor. It's not just action to consider their needs, not just action on their behalf, but mindfulness, mindfulness about them that leads you into action. For example, there's, there's nothing wrong with buying somebody a meal who walks up to you on Main Street here and says that they're hungry. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. The mindfulness that we see here in Psalm 41 is more like, well, now praying for that person. And the next time you walk down Main Street looking for them or someone like them and beginning to pray about and think about ways that you or your family or we can alleviate hunger in our town. That's the mindfulness that I think we see here in Psalm 41. Now, why does David say that such a person, that even he himself, is blessed? Why is he blessed? Well, keep reading verse 1. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. So blessed is he who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, this is how he is blessed. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers delivers him. Delivers who? The poor? No, it says delivers the one who considers the poor. That's how the one who considers the poor is blessed. The Lord treats him mercifully just as he has treated others mercifully. That's what David is saying. There's a reciprocity to this. God is treating him, David believes, God will treat him mercifully because he has treated others mercifully. Now, the basis of David's hope here, his hope that God would help him in the predicament that he's in, is this, because he has demonstrated kindness. Did you catch that? You've got to go all the way down to verse 1, to, uh, to verse 12 to see it, but it's there. Look at verse 12. He says, you have upheld me because of my integrity. The word integrity, it, it, meant, it meant to be like a statue to stand, to, 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 to seem solid and erect and, and upright. That was integrity. Well, what is David's integrity here? Is it his morality? No, he's confessing his sin in, in verses earlier. Is it his physical strength or his situation or the strength and advantage of his situation? Is that his integrity? No, he's on his sickbed, he's saying. He's sinned and he's on his sickbed. It can't be any of that. His integrity, his integrity is verse 1. The fact that he's considered the poor. 
you have to go back up to verse 1. That's the only bit of stability that David is talking about in this psalm, that he has considered the poor. Now, for all of you uh, Bible know-it-alls who might be thinking right now, hold on, wait a minute, we can't earn God's favor. It doesn't matter how nice we are, and no matter what we do, we can't earn his favor. His favor is something that he gifts to us by his grace, of course. Yes, yes. Yes, but I, I just want you to sit in the naked simplicity of Psalm 41 for a bit. Just sit in the awkwardness of what David is saying. David believed that God would show him the same compassion that he had shown to others. It's a very similar concept as to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. This is a true statement. But notice, notice how we have not violated or contradicted the true grace of God because it is not that someone is blessed because they have given mercy. According to Jesus and David, they are blessed because they've received mercy. They're blessed because they've received mercy, and in that blessedness, they give it out. If you're confused now, that's okay. Uh, I just want you to understand first that God cares deeply for the weak. And that includes you. The weak includes you. People who think biblically are mindful not only of the weakness of others, they are mindful of their own weakness as well. This is very clear in how David viewed himself. David remembered, even in this psalm, David remembered, and by the way, uh, Eugene Peterson years ago wrote a book on the psalms, and he said one of the major themes throughout the book of psalms is memory. The psalms continually remember things. The psalms remember God's kindness in the past to the psalmist. The psalmists remember their own sin. And that's something you see David doing right here in verses 4 and 5. Look, he remembers his own weakness. He says, as for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me. Why? For I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? If you're familiar with the David of the Old Testament, if you're familiar with many of his psalms, this is a typical situation for David. He's caught between a rock and a hard place. The rock is the consequences of his past actions, which is why he's now in trouble and maybe even sick. The hard place is his enemies taking advantage of his situation and pouncing on him. That's pretty... Have, do you know what that feels like? Right? I, I certainly do. When, when you're partly to blame, but you're also partly a victim. It's both kind of happening at the same time. You're just deserved for what you've done and, and, and an injustice in how you're being treated, no matter what you've done. And David finds himself in that situation and his memory recalls both his unjust suffering and his well-deserved guilt. And in his memory, he recalls something else. Look at verse 9. He says, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, that's an intimate thing, right? to eat at the king's table with him. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. One Old Testament scholar said the imagery here of of his friend lifting his heel against him. The lifting of the heel, it, it meant that somebody, would, if their heel is lifted against you, it means they've turned around and are moving away from you. If you can see their heel, the heel of their foot, they're moving away from you. And so we discover that this isn't like somebody kicking you in the face with their heel. This isn't aggression. It's abandonment. Somebody you trusted. Somebody who benefited from his, his generosity has turned away to his enemies. It's abandonment. How painful is it, and some of you know this, how painful to your soul is it when someone you have helped, maybe a child, maybe a student, 
Maybe somebody you've mentored. Maybe a good friend. Someone you thought was close. Someone whom you entrusted important information to. When they turn on you. So we learn here by watching David grieve before the Lord in hope, we learn that considering the poor, being mindful of the poor, includes being mindful of how much you are like them. I imagine David at this point remembering back to when he was hunted like an animal in the wilderness, living in caves, running from Saul the king who wanted his life. And we see evidence throughout David's life, well documented in the Old Testament. In other places we see evidence of David's recollection time and time again of his own sins. You know, despite David's, and we, we have a hard time with David because of some of the things he did and the sins he committed. Despite his great sins, which are well documented, it seems that David never really clung to pride. He showed great, even as a king, he showed great restraint to people who cursed him to his face. And I think that's because somehow David was not, we call him a man close to the heart of God, near to the heart of God, because I think he understood his own weakness and brokenness and never forgot it. So consider, consider from Psalm 41, this is the takeaway. Consider how God has cared for you in your weaknesses and extend care to others in theirs. And I want to talk about an, uh, an internal aspect of that and an external aspect of it. All right, consider God's kindness to you in your weaknesses and extend care to others in their weakness. And the internal aspect of that is that you and I, if you're following Jesus, must live in consideration of your own weakness. Living in consideration of your own weaknesses. Now, I don't mean refusing to heal. I don't mean refusing to move on and not persevering. I don't mean refusing to forgive and to reconcile. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean remembering that you were once sick. You know what it's like. You were once maybe poor or lonely. You remember what it was like to be bullied. You know that you were once guilty and many times have been. You know that it, <laughs> at least once in your life, and I hope you realize it's more than that, you were wrong. We see this lifestyle, this living in consideration of your own weakness in the Apostle Paul also. Paul would say to people, hey, I was a disaster, I was a wretch. Whenever he, he would talk to people about Christianity and the way and Jesus of Nazareth, he would, he would always bring up his messy, ugly, embarrassing, humiliating past. For instance, when, when he stood in chains uh, before King Agrippa and, 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 and Agrippa's uh, sister Bernice and the Roman governor uh, Festus, uh, one of the things he said to them was, I punished the, the first Christians. I, I punished them often in all the synagogues and I tried to make them blaspheme and in raging fury against them I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Now the flip side of that is Paul would also remind people as he did with his friend Timothy he would say Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Paul's memory, and I would suggest if you're a Christian, your memory, my memory, must make space in your thinking, make space for humility. That's what this kind of remembering does. It makes space in your thinking for humility and thankfulness and kindness. So living in consideration of your own weakness, but also serving then in light of the weaknesses of others. Living in consideration of your own weakness and serving in light of the weaknesses of others. God's compassion for you extends forward in your compassion for the needy and the weak. And those in whatever situation we find ourselves are misunderstood and cannot act and speak 
and provide for themselves. Paul said that when he finally got to meet the, 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 the three big apostles, Peter and James and John, uh, and, and they met him and they all agreed that they were all going to continue doing what they were doing to advance the message of the Christian gospel. He said, this is one of the things, this is, this, this is what Paul remembered years later. This is what they told me to do. They asked me to remember the poor. Like, Paul, go ahead. You go, we're preaching the gospel to the Jews in Jerusalem. You go ahead and you preach to the Gentiles in the, around the Mediterranean Sea. And, and as you, remember, and you preach the gospel, we want you to remember one thing. Don't forget the poor. And then he said, that's exactly the thing that I was most eager to do. And poverty takes many shapes, doesn't it? It's not only financial... It's not only about resources. Sometimes people are mentally or psychologically impoverished. Sometimes people are physically impoverished. Sometimes people are socially, relationally impoverished without an advocate, without a friend, without social safety and understanding. If you look, prayerfully look, there's always someone in your life who is impoverished in one of these ways or more. So, in light of the Christian message, as we see it in Psalm 41, consider how God has cared for you in your weakness and extend your care to others in theirs. And ask yourself now, have you been neglectful of this vital part of the Christian faith? And ask yourself whether you're a Christian or whether you're not quite there yet, <laughs> um, ask yourself, is there any space for weaknesses in your life? The weaknesses of, of, of others, and is there any space for admitting to yourself that you also are weak? If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, have you neglected to consider the situation and the plight and the needs of those who are weak? Have you forgotten that you were once sick or poor or lonely or guilty or wrong? Have you forgot that you were once um, enslaved to substance abuse? Have you forgotten that your ancestors were once unwanted strangers in the very society in which you now feel quite at home? Have you forgotten your own weakness? And are you blinded to the needs of those who are weak? around you? And have you forgotten what the Apostle James said, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction? Now, if you're not a Christian yet, have you neglected to consider your own poverty before the Creator? Maybe, maybe you're quite pleased with your... Uh, uh, the beneficiary way that you've been living towards others. Maybe you're quite happy and pleased with how you've cared for others. But have you considered your own poverty before God? Jesus of Nazareth said, again, in his great sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Have you considered that unless... In light of those words, unless you humble yourself, friend, before your God, unless you confess your own weakness and your own rebellion towards Him and your own spiritual poverty in light of His goodness and glory and perfect will for you, unless you do all those things and acknowledge your spiritual poverty, you will never enter into His peace and forgiveness an eternal blessing. Is there any space for weakness in your life? In this church? We must ask ourselves. That kind of weakness, this way of thinking about weakness, admitting your weakness to God, admitting your weakness to other people, admitting your weakness to yourself, that kind of weakness, that kind of... Uh, 
honesty. Uh, it, can't, it can't be found, it can't be obtained, it can't be possessed until you consider God's glorious, mighty, beautiful, gentle, yes, even weak Son. This is the foundation that, that God in Jesus Christ became, yes, of all things, weak. It said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Apostle Paul encouraging Christians to be generous. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you by His poverty might become rich. And Jesus' poverty began when He entered into human history as an embryo in Mary's womb. And it continued through his birth. He was birthed as dirtily, as, as messily and filthily as you and I were birthed. And it continued as he became a refugee at a very early age. And it continued as he grew up and lived a normal, commonplace, carpenter's life. Splinters, cuts, and all. And it continued as he became a rabbi who relied on the generosity of others for where he slept and the food that he ate. He didn't own anything. He didn't have anything to leave like an inheritance or property like you or I might even have. And his poverty continued when on the night that he was betrayed, he said, and it's recorded in John chapter 13, verse 18, speaking of Judas Iscariot, he who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. And then finally alone, abandoned by all of his friends, his poverty continued while he hung on a Roman cross and died the humiliating death of a criminal. You see, there is no version of poverty or weakness or need that Jesus Christ cannot and has not considered. No version of it. If you've lived it, if you're going through it now, He is mindful of it. He is mindful of you in your weakness. We don't think that way. We don't consider and admire weakness as one of our life goals. I don't remember taking a class, Weakness 101, at your university. I didn't even get a class in seminary called Weakness 101, and I'll tell you, I needed to hear it back then. Because it's been a lot of on-the-job on training ever since. But we don't think that way. We don't consider and admire and desire such weakness. But the resurrection proves otherwise. We don't think it's desirable what Jesus did. His, his own people were ashamed of him. His family thought he was crazy. It was Paul in, in 1 Corinthians who said, you know, you know Gentiles, they, uh, they think this stuff is just silly and foolish. And, and the Jews, they, they, it's a stumbling block to them. It's not what, this is not what they expected in their Messiah. But the resurrection proves otherwise. We don't like this type of weakness, but the resurrection says, hold on. This is God's type of weakness. God raising Jesus physically from the tomb three days later is proof that weakness is the only path to flourishing. Without the resurrection, weakness is weakness and we should all be avoiding it and ignoring it and denying it like the rest of the world. But Jesus rose from the dead which proves that God accepted his sacrifice and proves to you and me that weakness is the path to glory and flourishing and wholeness and reconciliation. It's weakness. That's what our culture is missing. No reconciliation without a willingness to be weak and serve your enemy. That's why Christians have to show the world what reconciliation is. We have the only true path to it. So, in light of the confusion about what David was saying earlier in Psalm 41... Our confidence is not in our own kindness to the poor and the weak and the needy. Our confidence is in His kindness to them, to you, to us. David, remembering 
Like when he was a young man out there with the sheep, as our sister described to us earlier, David remembered that the Lord was his shepherd. That kind of care, that kind of provision. Right? My, my, my cup overflows. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. David remembered God's kindness to him and extended that compassion forward. So that really at the end of the day, David's hope was in God's kindness, not in his own. And that needs to be the same case for me and for you. And you do the same. Jesus impoverished himself for you. Now you pray and find practical ways to impoverish yourself for the sake of others. And if Jesus could do that for his enemies, forgiving them on the cross, at the height of his poverty, there's nobody, there's nobody in this world and in the community and in this society that you cannot impoverish yourself to for the sake of the one who became poor for you. So consider God's care for you in your weakness and extend care to others in theirs. And see and live that Christian faith which recognizes the needs of others and knowing full well your own needs as well. In light of the cross of Jesus. God cares for his weak ones. Amen? And he gives us hearts for those who are weak. Let's pray. Father, we confess for how we think and live in an upside-down way. How we prize strength and aggression and intimidation. How we promote ourselves even if it seems in a simple and joyful and uh, lackadaisical way, uh, forgive us for failing to see what it meant that your son became poor for us. Oh, Father, may we humble ourselves in his name. May we stoop to serve one another. Father, show us our weakness and show us how your strength and power and grace is made visible through it. Father, teach us how to be like our Savior Jesus. Teach us how to be meek and humble people. Teach us how to forgive those who hurt us and to be patient with those who annoy us and to confess our sin to one another. Father, fill us with the generosity that your Holy Spirit affords to us as we consider your grace to us. Help us to live in light of our weakness and to live and to, uh, to serve in light of the weakness of others. In Jesus' name, amen.